Here we go, it's the Combine Podcast. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Cop Out Podcast and today we are delighted to be joined by the one and only James Pierce from The Athletic. James is here to talk about his new book that he co-wrote with Oliver Kay, Simon Hughes and other award-winning writers from The Athletic. At the end of the storm, stories from Liverpool's historic title win. James, how are you pal? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. How are you guys? You okay? Very good buddy. Pleased to have you. Nice one for coming on James, really appreciate that. No problem. Um, so James, the book, I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, one of the things that I really, really appreciate about the book is it wasn't really a look back in the style of writing. So let's say, let's write a book from our perspective right now. It's it's more like all your work from last August all the way right up until July, put in the order so the reader can really see what was written at the time that the events folded along the season. And that sort of enables us to see the emotions and see the words in the page and the excitement build up page by page. Was it always meant to be like that or did it happen organically? Yeah, but you know what? It was, I think it was more a case of come the end of the season because it had been such a, you know, a historic one and one unlike any other with, you know, the, all the circumstances surrounding it with the, with the pandemic and being so close to, to the achievement and then being denied it and having to sit tight. And then obviously it happening behind closed doors. I think there was a, there was a feeling that, you know what, we've, we've had some great stuff over the course of the season. Why don't, why don't we put it into a book? Because, um, you know, of course people sabbatic only really launched in the UK in at the start of last season. So you know, a lot of the subscribers maybe wouldn't have seen everything throughout the season. And I think also a book with a book, I think you naturally kind of open, open up hopefully the athletic to a new audience that, um, you know, maybe maybe people that don't have you know the app on their phone or or, or log into web the website to read the, the content. So um, yeah, I think it was you know the, the guys at back page and um, you know the, the 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 heads at the athletic just thought, Do you know what, it it's been such an incredible year. Why not mark it with um, with hopefully you know the kind of keepsake that people will enjoy looking back on. And um, yeah, I mean the positive thing for me was that. It didn't, vo- you know, it didn't involve a huge amount of work in between yeah. seasons because essentially it was all already there, and um, yeah. you know, it was the publishers were were pretty keen that yeah, it should almost just tell the story of the season, as you said, rather than kind of tr- you know changing things subsequently. Just you know, this was how it was at the time, and um, and just pick the hopefully the the best of the Liverpool content. Um, from from August right through to you know what was it July back end yeah. of July at the end. Yeah, that's true. It's madness, isn't it? But one of the things is is great about it is when you look it back at it's really fun to look back at something like that because you know what's happened. So for example, I, I liken it in this age of social media uh, when the news broke about Sadio Mane and Virgil Van Dijk's transfers. You can find those tweets when the news broke and people looking back saying, "Oh, what a waste of money for Mane." You overspent on Verge and it's fun to look back at some of the comments is it because you know what's happened and that's the joy and the excitement you get from reading a book like this because you're reading thing and oh, I remember that happening. I remember that. I mean, you're really excited because you know what's happened in real life and that's why it's a joy to read from start to finish. Um, but going back to last August where the book starts, you have a sit down conversation uh, with Tom Werner. So, you know, in 2010, FSG had bought the club. The first game was the derby where we, I think we were 19th in the table. Um, when you had that sit-down conversation um, with Tom, I mean, we'd just come back off winning, you know, the first major trophy, if you like, under FSG. How much did it mean to them to get that first big trophy? Yeah, I think and I th- I, it, it was huge for them. And I think that that really shone through in the, you know, the hour or so I had in his office at, at Fenway Park because, um, you know, of, of course, you know, Tom Werner and John W. Henry and Mike Gordon, the businessman, but... You know, the the reality is that if they were only in it to make a quick buck, they would have they would have sold Liverpool long ago. You know, I, I think you know they for them it was the huge motivation was to try and be the people that that put Liverpool back at the pinnacle of European and English football. So um so yeah, in fact he 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 was he was just actually in the process that week when I saw him of I think the interior designers were in rejigging his office and. Um, you know, a, a massive big frame picture on the wall of of Jordan Henderson lifting that European Cup to the heavens and and the ticker tape going off and um, yeah it was you know, it was it was interesting because I, I noticed pushed to the back in his office that day was um, 
the picture of Liverpool winning the League Cup at, at, at Wembley back in 2012, because you imagine probably for a long time that was unfortunately the highlight because it had been a, a pretty barren spell in terms of glory. Um, so yeah, you know, to, to see that picture there alongside the um, you know the 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 uh, World Series winning Red Sox teams, I think that showed you what kind of what it meant to them. And also the other thing that struck me from that conversation with him. Um, but it was it was very much this is just the start, you know. This isn't this isn't you know we've ticked that box, you know. Now you know now we'll smoke a big cigar and enjoy that European Cup. It was it was very much right now for the Premier League because you know he Tom you know talked talked in detail about how you know he knew it was coming up to thirty years and you know how special it would be to mark that anniversary by by going that one step better. Um, and uh, yeah, it was you know, a fascinating conversation with him on a, a whole host of topics that um, you know, and uh, you know, his his optimism in uh, that you know it was a baking hot afternoon in Boston when I met him. You know, it was uh, that optimism of his that it was going to be the the start of something very special was was proved proved right in the end. Absolutely, and you know, still focusing on that summer. Um, it was clear the title was the, the the big priority yet again, but even more so after what happened in May. Um, there were no big names that were added to the squad and Klopp had felt that he was happy with what he had. But from your perspective, uh, as James Pearce, the Liverpool fan, uh, what were your thoughts on that, the fact that we hadn't really added to the squad? Yeah, I must admit, I had kind of mixed emotions because I could understand, you know, from from speaking to, to you know, from, from being involved with the manager and, and the coaching staff and being around them on that tour, I think you could, you could sense that, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't, there was no sense of like we've missed out here by not strengthening. I think you know, Klopp kept on saying the reality is it's actually very difficult to improve on what we've got. And you know, he and he talked about the young players that were coming through and not wanting to block their path. And um, you know, some of the players who have been injured the previous year that he felt you know the stage was set for them to play a bigger role. So all of that made sense. But I'd be you know, I'd be lying if if I said that. I didn't have some nagging doubts about the depth because, you know, I think as a as a fan and probably as a journalist as well, you know, you you know there there is a huge amount of excitement attached to getting a few new faces in the door, and you know, I did I did wonder whether it might be a missed opportunity not to not to really you know go and buy from a position of strength to 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 really kick on, but um, yeah, I was I was pleasantly amazed by by the way in which. You know, I think probably at the time I didn't really appreciate just how important that that Champions League victory in Madrid was yeah. because um, you know it felt big at the time, but I think it was only over the course of last season that I realised that for this for this group of players and for this manager and all the staff, it was just it was just lift off really because I think you know Klopp had had to handle any what was it six final defeats he'd had on yeah. the bounce as a manager and you know and Liverpool had had so many near misses and. And, and you, you know, and you know, people mocking that you know, for all the progress, what have you got to show for it? And then, and and I think also it just completely kind of negated the the heartache of being pipped to the title by City by one point because I think where where usually you know if if, if Liverpool had ended ended that season empty-handed, then yeah. I think it would have been you know I I, I just. I don't. I don't think winning the Premier League happens without winning the Champions League because I just think yeah. I think that was just so huge for everyone. And then, you know, and then you know, you could you could sense early on last season that that this team meant some serious business and was I was going to take some stopping. And I think it's it, probably when I was going through the book as well. I think with hindsight, you actually think to yourself, well, it actually felt. You know, I don't know why. I, I, like, to honest, like most people, I, I probably didn't allow myself to think it, the job was done till probably mid-January or something. Probably when when we beat United at Anfield. But in 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 hindsight, you actually think it, you know, it was probably over kind of November November time, really, with the the gap that had opened up. But you know, I think yeah. it was it was just because of those previous kind of doses of heartache that you. you know, I don't think anyone wanted to uh, get ahead of themselves. Of course. And you do detail in the book because there are some very interesting pieces there how Jurgen Klopp was approached for the job and what he did when he first arrived. Some really, really funny stuff. But how much respect is there between FSG and Klopp? Because it does come across in the book. But And it's a lot of stuff that 
you know, a lot of Liverpool fans we don't understand because we're not privy to that sort of stuff. But there is a massive amount of respect between the two parties, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, huge. And I think um, you know the, the relationship has been so strong from you know the first time that they that they met in um, you know a, in, a, in a law firm in, in in Manhattan in New York just prior to Klopp agreeing to take the the job on. And you know, I think you know they they they'd felt. If Klopp had been available previously, he would have he would have got the job. I think for, for FSG, it was a case of third time lucky managing to to convince him to take it on. And I think you know, for Klopp, Klopp could have had the pick of any job, couldn't he? In um, in European football, you no, know, it was. But you know, I think when he when he met the ownership, he, he thought, well, you know, do you know what? These are people that I can work with, and um, you know, and, I, and you know, of course, he he has huge sway in terms of the decision making process of the club, which which he's earned. But he's also, you know, he's he, he also fully appreciates that he has to operate within a framework at a club where, as big as Liverpool are and as successful as they've been in the last few years, they still have to live within their means. And um, yeah. and, and I think that suits him to a large extent. You know, I think it was that that was part of the attraction for Klopp. When he yeah. when he first arrived, the fact that you know it wasn't it wasn't you know inheriting a, a bottomless pit of cash, um, you know they knew he was gonna it was a long term project he was taking on, uh, and he knew that the owners you know had said essentially right you know what whatever can be generated goes back into the club we don't take a penny out but yeah. we're also not we're not Sheikh Mansur we're not Roman Abramovich, um. Because I think Klopp, you know, the way he is, he, he just he knew that if he could if he could turn Liverpool into a trophy winning machine again, that it would be that much more satisfying because it would mean that much more the way in which he's had to do it. And um, you know, I think the the other thing with Klopp, which is is like his attention to detail is just ridiculous. When you you know, I think with Klopp, there's such a focus on. You know the the personality and the you know the hugs and the beaming smile and the man management that sometimes what gets overlooked is you know just you know leaving absolutely no stone unturned right from you know the the throwing coach to Mona Nemo with the nutrition side of things to the sports science department um, you know every every single step of the way you know that you know it's quite rare for a team challenging at the top to devote such a huge amount of time to set pieces. As Liverpool, you know, have done the, the past couple of years, but I think, you know, that stemmed from Klopp looking at it and saying, "Well, hang on a minute, why should it, why should it only be limited teams that that almost focus on set pieces? Because set pieces are such a huge part of, of football these days. Why don't, why can't we be the best at set pieces, even though we can score goals in so many different ways? And um, yeah, you know that that has no doubt that that has been absolutely huge along the way that, you know, all those little one percents that, that added up to put Liverpool in, in such a, you know, ridiculously strong position. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll look back at the 1920 season as obviously arguably our most favourite season ever, but it was a strange one for so many reasons. And in the book, you've got certain chapters and certain elements of it where you, you, you look back at things and think, oh my God, I forgot that happened that, that, that season. For example, when the Burnley game, away when Sadio and um, and Mo had that little bit of a spat in terms of like yeah. the passing but it showed like the determination of this team and it was it was nice to be reminded of those moments a little bit as well but one of my favourite parts of the book was December um, because it you know it was a big month for us anyway it was you know, the fixture pile up it was famous for a win um, with our B team as you quoted um, over Everton in the FA Cup you know champions of the world famous victory away at Leicester um, but the piece that was in the, the most was about Trent um, regarding the you know the Leicester game, and it was like it was like the perfect compliment to a young man who's achieved so much in his early career that some players don't achieve in their entire career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know he is he is a phenomenon, really, Trent, in terms of you know to to achieve what he's achieved at, at such a young age. You know, most most players can't even dream of of, of doing that thing across their entire career yet, you know, let alone by the age of. 21 to have done what he'd done with you know winning the the biggest trophies in football and and even playing for his country at a World Cup as well. Um, so yeah, I think you know that Leicester away is probably right up there with you know I'd say it was probably Liverpool's most complete league performance on route to winning the league and it it just felt massive in so many ways that night because I'd I'd been over in Qatar you know the the week leading up to that game for the for the Club World Cup and. It was, you know, it was a real slog. Those two games over there, it was, you know, 
it was it was hard work. It was you know it, it made the trip worthwhile. The fact that Liverpool won that trophy for the first time, but I, I was fearful going um, to the King Power that night because you know I think let's not forget at the time Leicester were Liverpool's nearest rivals. I think they were they were second at the time, and you know they were people were saying, well, if Leicester win this, you know the, the, you know they they could then kick on and really push Liverpool close. Um, and you know, especially on the back of all the travelling, and you know, it was, you know, I just thought, wow, this is a really tricky game, and to go there and dismantle what what on form was the next best team in England in the way that Liverpool did, I think it wasn't just what it did what it did for Liverpool, but it was like how deflating it was for everyone else to think, you know, oh, for, you know, for God's sake, they've just been, on, you know, all those thousands of miles away, played two games in pretty energy sapping conditions, and then they come back and put on a show like that and um yeah there's no doubt that Trent Trent was the absolute star that night and it was you know I think it's there's always an interesting debate about Trent that's kind of you know probably rolled on for a few years now in terms of where is his long-term future in terms of position um you, you know I think probably going back a few years there was an expectation I'd say probably even amongst certainly the staff at the academy that you'd speak to would say oh yeah I think you know over time he probably will you know the same progression as someone like Steven Gerrard and go from full back to centre midfield where you know he played played in the middle of the pitch um for a chunk of his his youth career but i think more and more you know you you kind of like and especially probably Leicester away rammed it home was actually why on earth would you move him because if someone can dictate a game from right back and and light it up like that what why would you what what's the point in shifting him and um and I think, especially of course, in the way that Klopp's brand of football and in, in his system, you know, the two fullbacks are so, you know, so incredibly important um, that you know I think Trent probably more than anyone has almost like reinvented the the fullback position in terms of what he gives Liverpool. Um, you know, the number of assists and you know, he's just an absolute dream, isn't he, for the for the front three with the um, you know the ammunition that he provides. Absolutely, and. A lot of people thought that um, the Leicester game was the pivotal in obviously you know winning the league, and everyone thought thought of it as that was the moment when. But I think probably the week in January when we played Spurs and we played Man United, that was the week where it's like, well, if we can get six points out of these two games, that will be the game. And being in being at Anfield um, after the Man United game, it was one of the best atmospheres I've ever experienced at Anfield because it, I've never felt it shake like that where we we sort of felt like we knew that it was going to happen. From your perspective, um, two questions on this one. One, did you did you start to believe then that, well, that's it, it's, that's the game that it's done it? And also as well, um, Ross Chanley has asked, um, would love to get your thoughts on having fans back in the stadiums. Um, obviously, currently not the right time, but when the rate drops, should it be a priority? And does does it take away from your enjoyment of the job a little bit? Yeah, well, on the first one, you know, you're right. For me, when I think about, if I think about one single moment that that I enjoyed more than any other in the whole of the title winning season, it would be when Mo Salah slotted home that second against United because, you know, it was it was the goal, of you know, the, the manner of the goal, especially, you know, I think Alisson provided the assist, didn't he? And you know, Mo runs half the length of Anfield to score. But it was it was just that outpouring of emotion when that ball hit the net because, you know, I think even, even though, I th- you know, and I'm sure it was the same for you guys when, you know, I'd speak to my mates and it was quietly, it was like, you know, this is it. You know, we're going to win the league this season. Now, this is absolutely done and dusted, you know, despite, and, it, you, and then your mates would say, you know, don't say that, don't say that. You know, we, we've been here before, don't say it. And it was like, all right, you know, we won't say it, we won't talk about it. But it was almost like, at that point, it was like, it was like a kind of like the, the lid had been lifted off and everyone just went, you know, sod it. it it's happening and we're, we're happy to tell the world that it's happening, that we are going to win the league. And um, so, yeah, that was that was just absolutely spine tingling that, you know, the, 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 the noise when, you know, it, you know, the celebrations that day when um, I think Alison was first to first to, to <laughs> celebrate yeah. with Mo, wasn't he? Like. The, um, yeah. It was to set some kind of land speed record. I think we're getting him to him that quick. But you, and you're right. It does. It it does. It does tally with the second second question there in terms of what it's like covering games now. Because you know I, I'm one of the very few lucky ones who still gets to go to. Uh, you know I've been going to all the home games and um, you know and I, and I feel I feel guilty in a way when I, to say this because I am very fortunate to be there. 
but it's actually not particularly enjoyable because you know I, I think it's only till you lose all the fans from games that you actually it makes you appreciate what is so special especially about a trip to Anfield because it's absolutely soulless and I'm, I've been I've been blown away by how well Liverpool have performed without fans in general because you know it's it, it, you know and you know I interviewed Andy Robertson about probably about five six weeks ago now and you know he was brutally honest like I said to him you know what is it like you know what because you know for me watch for me being in the stadium it's it's weird because you know, you, you know everyone's voice echoes around the stadium you can hear what the players are saying you know it was it, it feels like you're watching a training session and he just said yeah he said football you know it, it's rubbish it's absolutely rubbish without fans he said but you know what can we do you know this is the app this is this is what we have to do at the moment to to be able to keep playing and you know and, and he's right that you know it's still better than not having football at all but mm. you know it, it's such a it's such a pale imitation of of what you know of, of what we what we all absolutely love and um yeah, just just devastated that you know, obviously with the you know with with the infection rate going back up again, that the club had to ditch plans to, you know, it would have only been I think probably last week, maybe two weeks ago, the Sheffield United game was going to be the game when yeah. you know, I'd written a few stories about that that they were you know that they they put a huge amount of work in Liverpool to to try and get kind of um, you know I think it was going to be about 20, 23 percent capacity yeah. in to start off with and then build it up. Um, so yeah, that I mean it has to be an absolute priority for for so many different reasons because i think you know of course for the clubs themselves there's there's that financial element but i think also at the moment you know so many people i know you know they they, they live for going to the game you know it's yeah. it's it's such a huge part of their life and to be for that to be wrestled away um you know and the, and the, the games and the spectacles just aren't the same and i think you know when you're sat at home and I've, I've done it myself with some of the away games with liverpool you know and you've got the fake crowd noise on you know, I think it doesn't. You know, it really doesn't give you a, pr a proper picture of what it is actually like football behind yeah. closed doors. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, the grim thing is, we it, it looks like we could be in this position to like February, March time because yeah. you know, I, you know, th that seems to be the kind of word at the moment behind the scenes that you know it could be that long before we get fans back in. But yeah, the the sooner the better because. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty grim at the moment without you know without without anyone there. Absolutely, and you know even when we won the title and we lifted it in front of no fans, it was it was lovely to see that the the effort that the club and the Premier League had put into to make it as as best we as we could without us being in the in the stadium. But when it finally came time to write in that piece, you've been dying to write for years and years. You know, uh, was it a challenge to write the fact that Liverpool are now Premier League champions? Had you? I had it in your head what you were going to write for years, or could your fingers not type as fast as what your brain was going to say? You just like, <laughs> I can't believe we've done it. <laughs> it was, it was just all a bit surreal to be honest, because obviously, you know, in your head, you know, I, I was my my first ever trip to Anfield was was October nineteen ninety. So, um, you know, Liverpool, had, uh, you know, had, had been crowned champions for the eighteenth time just a few months earlier, and you know, and and, and so like. You know, for, for for that thirty year period, you know, you know, how many times did you every August it was like, you know, is this going to be the year? Is this, you know, and you know, we, and we'd only come close probably what three or four times in that in that period. So, you know, I think of all the you, you know, over the years, probably in your head, you kind of have yeah. so many. You know, you think to yourself, I wonder, you know, wonder how it's going to when it does happen. How will it happen? And um, yeah, I don't, I think, <laughs> you know, you know, none of us ever thought that it would happen in the middle of a. You know, a global pandemic yeah. where we're, you know, essentially, well, you know, of course, it mathematically happened with us cheering on Chelsea. Um, <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, which just made it even more surreal, didn't it? Cheering on Chelsea yeah. winning in an empty Stamford Bridge, and um, yeah, so it was, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was really emotional, but also surreal as well in terms of, you know, and I think because also as well, it, you know, I, I always envisaged because I've been so used to the success Liverpool have had. Certainly, in my in my lifetime, it always felt like it had been a struggle that we, we we very rarely do anything the easy way, and that you know it was because I, I, I thought when Liverpool did finally win the league, it would be you know a final day of the season job or something yeah, yeah. You know, put put through the ringer. Um, so you know, I didn't you know the only the only real hurdle put in Liverpool's path was was coronavirus, wasn't it? Because you know, in terms yeah. of the actual you know the actual competition itself, it was. 
you know, it was an absolute procession. So, um, so yeah, it was, yeah, it was a real, a real mix, or a mix of emotions, I'd say, Just, uh, probably relief as well in abundance. Because, uh, you know, when, you know, especially even though, you know, you'd speak to people high up at the club and you know, speak to other people in the Premier League and they would always be confident that the season would get completed. But you know, there was also a period there when, you know, when there was all that talk about null and void and, um, and you were you were thinking, oh my God, you know, how, how, this this can't be happening. So, um, so yeah, it was just a you know a real mix of you know probably delight and relief and yeah and just surreal as well because you know I was I was in Anfield that night when the the trophy was lifted and you're right I think I think the club and the Premier League did everything they possibly could to make that as as special as it could have been and it was brilliant that. You know, despite having to jump through a ridiculous amount of hoops to make it happen, they finally were able to, you know, let the players' families be there to witness it. Um, yeah. But still, you know, still also a degree of sadness for me when you're looking around and you're thinking, you know, imagine what Anfield would be like tonight. You know, you know this, and and it, and um, you know, the sad thing is for me that we, you know, we we were denied that, and you know, and and the parade. I just think. Because you know, I, I missed the parade after Madrid because I was I was still in Madrid, um, so you know I was I was you know I was thinking you know I, I, I couldn't wait to 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 be around that this time around. And I know I know obviously Klopp said there will be a parade at some point, but you're like it's just not this. You know it's the, the you know that the, the moment's kind of gone, isn't it? We you know we all hope that Liverpool go and retain the title next summer, and by then you know by by next May you know touch wood. You know, having the parade won't be an issue, but um, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of different emotions because of the you know the the, the kind of extreme circumstances around it. Yeah, there was, mate. And as we move into this season now, and um, this is where I was going to bring your thoughts on this now is the the transfer window caused again another bit of a social media frenzy as well because of the pandemic, because of you know money and this all that sort of stuff and. You know, it's been a weird summer. We thought Timo Werner was a, was a nailed on in a red shirt. There was talk of Wijnaldum leaving. Uh, Simicast is the first one to arrive. Uh, Diogo Jota's announced out of nowhere. And then there was the Thiago Saga, Willy won't he? But obviously that was due to Bayern Munich's progression in, into winning the Champions League. But we ended up getting our man in the end. The Liverpool have recruited really, really well. But at this stage of, of us having this conversation, James, we sit top of the Premier League. We're top of our Champions League group stage, 100% record, no goals conceded. All this with an injury crisis as well. They're missing practically every key player so far this season. I'll just sum up what's happened so far. I mean, yeah, do you know what? It, it, it was, I had this conversation with someone earlier that I don't think there's ever a quiet week, is there, where Liverpool Football Club are concerned? Because, you know, such a... Even running through what happened to Liverpool in October is just a joke when you think, you know, <laughs> to, you know to, to start with, you know, the, what was it? Probably Liverpool's worst defeat in nearly 60 years or something. You know, the yeah. you know absolute <laughs> humiliation at, at Villa Park and then, you know, the injustice of the Merseyside derby and what happened there with decisions and, and losing Van Dijk and losing Thiago. And, you know, again, you know, and... and you know, rivals must have been absolutely licking their lips, thinking, you know, the wheels are coming off it. You know, um, yeah. you know, this, this you know, this, this is this is where the Liverpool juggernaut stops. And then to go and win, to go and win five out of five since, and you know, win games in different ways, where you know it has been a bit of a struggle at times. But um, I think it's just testament to what Klopp has created at Liverpool in so many ways, in terms of you know the recruitment side of things has been unbelievable and there's no doubt that's the biggest factor in putting Liverpool back where they are you know n not just in terms of buying well but also selling well and then you know using those funds wisely and the way in which he's developed players and you know especially brought you know bringing through youngsters I mean I'm absolutely blown away by you know how Reese Williams has, has stepped up and yeah. grasped his opportunity and you know you look at how well Curtis Jones played as well um, against that Atalanta, you know, Nat Phillips, the way that he stepped in. Um, and, and, and I think that's all, that, that is all linked into the culture at Melwood of just, you know, the, the standards are just so high. And, you know, Pep Linders, who you know, probably the Pep Linders interview that I did in the book, it's probably my, my favourite interview that I did in the whole of last season because he's yeah. such a, a passionate, unarticulate, you know, absolute hive of knowledge, Pep Linders. And, you know, and he he kind of talked about how you know it's all about we train at match intensity. So he said, you know, that is why players who haven't played for maybe five six weeks are able to just go straight in 
and where traditionally we'd have maybe said, well, you know, he's, he's bound to be rusty or, you know, you're going to have to cut in some slack because he's, he's not match fit. He said, you know, they are match fit because if you train with us, you're match fit because, you know, it, it's, it's that intense. It's that, it's that sharp. And, you know, if anyone's not absolutely bang on it, then you've yeah. got professionals of the caliber of like Jordan Henderson and James Milner who will come down on you like a, like a ton of bricks. So, um, yeah, it's been a, you know, just such an eventful start to this season. But um, yeah, when you when you when you think of the key personnel that have been that, that have been missing, and you know, Cater as well has been missing. Of course, I'll say Chamberlain has been out since since pre season, and you know, like everyone, you know, absolutely buzzing at the you know the the sight of Thiago playing in that second half down at Stamford Bridge, and then you know, through no no fault of his own, we've barely seen him since because. You know of, of COVID and then and then with the injury from that horrendous challenge from Richarlison. So um, yeah, that's that's the exciting thing that you think. Well, there's actually you know a, a yeah. fair bit more to come. You know, it's you know Liverpool have managed to to come through this period of unbelievable adversity, and um, yeah, and if they if they can get a positive result of the Etihad on the weekend, then um, you know they're going to be in fantastic shape with with reinforcements. You know, uh, to come back shortly. Absolutely, and it, it ties into a question that we've uh, we just got. Do you do you think that Thiago will be available for Sunday? I wish I knew the answer to that. It was, um, you know, I think anyone that's seen Jurgen Klopp's press conference says recently will will know that he um, he hasn't really given much away when it comes to um, you know injury updates. And I think you know clearly he thinks, especially during a period of of just you know unbelievable kind of you know intensity with the, the games coming so thick and fast that yeah. he wants to keep teams guessing. He you know he, he hasn't been massively forthcoming with you know exactly what's wrong with certain players and 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 how long they're going to be out for. I mean, you know, like like everyone, you know, it's, you know T, T, everyone I think everyone knows that Thiago was out on the grass at Melwood last week doing some doing some individual work with the um with the rehab staff and you know usually you, you're looking at you know maybe a week of doing that and then getting the yeah. green light to, to join in fully with the squad. But um, I'm, I'm not aware that he is he's trained fully yet. Hopefully that will change in the next day or two because um, yeah, certainly certainly post Merseyside derby when you know of course on that Sunday when we had the you know the, the devastating news that, that Van Dijk had, had done his ACL the. The, the update on Thiago was a lot more positive that it would it would only be a, you know a couple of weeks so um, yeah I think if he's not back for Sunday then you know it was, as long as he hasn't had a, a significant setback then hopefully you know, soon after the international break yeah true and it's it's mad isn't it we're coming to up to another international break we're in November and all of a sudden January will be here in no time when I think everybody's talking about you know the centre back situation and uh, again someone's asked you James. Uh, do you think that with Bayern Munich withdrawing their contract for David Alaba, will Liverpool make a move for him? I think there's a number of names that we've been linked with, but also this one has sort of caught a bit of speed the past uh, week to 10 days. But what are your thoughts on, on David Alaba and uh, joining Liverpool? It's, a, uh, it's an interesting one. I think, you know, I, I, I really like Alaba and, um, you know, I'd, 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 it's, it's one that I'd, you know, I'd, I'd like to happen. I'd be, you know, I, I can't say I've heard his name mentioned as a as an alternative at, at the moment, you know, I think um, you know, it was well documented that you know Ben Lu Ben White at, at Brighton was you know extensively scouted, and um, you know I think Quebec at, at Schalke is a is another one, and um, you know Upper Meccano uh, is another another option. So I think you know from from what I've read and, and been told from our, by our you know our, our counterparts over in Germany, I think you know the word seems to be that Alaba. You know, quite fancy is going to going to Spain if he was to if he was to move on from there, and you know whether whether it's still whether he might still end up coming to some kind of agreement with Bayern. It, you know, it doesn't look particularly likely at the moment. But yeah. so you know, and then Bayern have obviously got a decision to make, haven't they? Whether they're you know do, do they do they cash in in January or um or decide to keep hold of him for the the rest of the season? So um you know I yeah I I I I, I, I can't honestly say that I know that. That Liverpool have is someone that they're looking to line up or anything like that at the moment. You know, the the people I've spoken to at Liverpool in terms of the centre back situation have said at the moment it's just too early. They said to to even yeah. make any judgment calls on what they're going to do because you know I think I think they're still obviously waiting to 
to to be very clear in terms of Van Dyke's you know kind of rehab schedule and when they're likely to have him. You know what happens with Matip. You know the hope is that Matip will stay fit and um, and put together the kind of runner games that he hasn't been able to to put together over the last twelve months. So you know that's another factor to to throw into the mix as well. Um, and then even you know Reese Williams, I think you know, we, you know everyone always kind of. You know, think you know we, we, you want something shiny and new, and but it was you know if if Reese Williams continues to perform at the level in which he has done, then you know I think you'd question you know what, what, why why you would be going and and spending a, a lot of money in January. So um so yeah, I think I think there's just a lot up in the air in terms of what happens fitness wise and um whether Liverpool do go and buy in in January. Um you know I, I think it and and I think. If if they do bring someone in in January, I think it'll be someone for the long term rather than you know I don't I don't think you will see like a you know certainly not a Stephen Corker type signing or a, yeah. or even a Ragnar Klavan I think because I think you could look at the squad and say well you know uh, you know having not replaced Day and Lovren you know you you you're probably in a position where you you need him to sign another centre half anyway if not if not in January then probably next summer. Um, mm. Even with Reese Williams coming through, because I think, I think the thing with Fabino for me is yes, he can play the position and he's you know he's and he's done it very well. But you know I, I think he's the best holding midfielder in the Premier League, so I, I don't particularly want to see Fabino playing centre back. I want to, yeah. I, I you know it's a shame that you know we haven't seen it since. But I, lo- I love the look of the midfield against Everton, where you know you had Fabino sitting and Henderson and Thiago. Um, either side, you know, I think hopefully that will be the future that we see, you know, a, a, a lot. And obviously, you know, if you're going to use Fabino there, then you, you probably do need another another option at centre half. Yeah, definitely. Based on uh, what you've just said there, James, and obviously the conversation that we've had, uh, one uh, one last question for one of our viewers has said, uh, "What's James' expectation of Liverpool this season? Is a Champions League and Premier League double a possibility, or with the condensed season and the injuries, is it unrealistic? But if so," What do you think we should prioritise from Martin Barton? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't really, I don't think there'll be any prioritising this time around. I think, um, you know, I, I just think, I think last season was a bit different because I, it just felt that last season was just all about winning the Premier League. You know, it's getting that thirty-year, um, you know, that that drought. You know, just making sure that, that that ended. I think you know, as 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 devastating as it was to go out in the manner in which Liverpool did against Atletico, um, yeah. you know, it was it was softened by the fact that you know, do, do you know what, the, the thirty year wait is is coming into an end. That was the big one, I think. And I, I don't, I don't, and I, you know, I, I think, I think for Klopp that was the case last season. But this time around, I don't, I don't think there will be a, a priority. I think Klopp will believe that as long as as long as he gets a bit of good fortune in terms of the injury situation, that there's no reason why Liverpool can't sustain a challenge on on both fronts, and you know, whether they can win them both, I mean, it's that is a huge ask. As as well as as well as Liverpool have done, and as you know, and, and as talented as this squad is, um, you know, I, I think I think that is that is going to be tough to you know to just because it is just so so relentless um the, the the schedule and all the rest of it but you know when you look around Europe at the moment you know with the exception of Bayern you know I don't I don't really see anyone that you look at and think you know I wouldn't yeah. fancy I wouldn't fancy playing them so um yeah I I, I you know I, for, for me personally I you know I want to see Liverpool go and retain the title um that would that would still be my preference but yeah. Um, you know, Klopp talks about want, telling his players to be greedy, and um, you know he will. I, I don't think you'll catch him, you know, drawing up a pecking order because he'll, he'll he'll want them both. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've had both, so I'll be happy with either. Uh, what about you, Mick? Would you be happy with either? I th- yeah, I agree with James. I think Premier League's got to be a priority, hasn't it? After especially after last year, finally winning it. Not getting quite the uh, the parade we wanted. Well, no parades, and I'm not. If we can if we can get it again next year, that's got to be obviously the goal because we need to be um, getting those titles in the bag. And I mean, if we got like James said, the squads maybe looking a bit thin on the ground, maybe to to push on both fronts realistically. But like James said, it, it depends who 
who we sign in January, who's the prognosis of Van Dijk and who, who we get back, back, back from injury. So, Premier League yeah. for me. I'll say. Fair enough, mate. Well, James, listen, mate, I could sit here and talk all day about the Reds with you, but I feel the more I talk to you, the more I'll give more details away of this because I've got so many <laughs> questions on it, mate. It's brilliant. But uh, for everybody that is viewing, if you've not picked up your copy at End of the Storm yet, go and get it. If you want to relive the story of our 19th title win, go and buy it. If you want to hear the story and the saga about, about Coutinho, go and buy it. If you want to find out why Michael Edwards is a shrewd genius, go and buy it. And if you want to hear what, what Klopp did with a Nike rep when he signed for Liverpool, go and buy it. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a great addition to any memorabilia. James, thank you once again, mate, for coming on the show. Uh, and we'll look forward to having you back uh, again, if that's all right with you, mate. Yeah, no problem, Naz. Yeah, nice chatting to you. You nice too, fun. mate. That was us at the Cop Out Podcast. We really appreciate the views. Give us a like, comment and subscribe and we will see you next time. Hello. Hello.